All right, so we sidetracked from Isaiah on Resurrection Sunday. We are back in Isaiah tonight. Isaiah chapter 33. So turn, turn your Bibles there. Isaiah 33. Tonight marks the end of the woes. Yay! We're going to make an end of woes tonight. We come to the last woe in this section of Isaiah, chapters 28 through 33, is what we've called the book of woes. They're all connected, by the way. It's not just by default that we call this the book of woes. It's not just because each of these chapters begins with a woe, an oive, if you will. But we are in this section that that even in terms of thematics is all bound together. The first woe was the woe to Ephraim, northern Israel, chapter 28. Second woe is the woe to Ariel, which means God's hearth, speaking of Jerusalem, so Judah. So first a woe to northern Israel, then a woe to southern Judah, the two kingdoms. And then in chapters 30 and 31, we get the third woe, which is a woe to the rebellious children, which is all of those who would go down and make an alliance with Egypt rather than making an alliance with the Spirit of God. We talked about that last Wednesday night. So Ephraim, southern Judah, and then all those who would ally themselves with someone other than God, even in the face of threat and danger. In chapter 32, as Isaiah often does, we get kind of a reprieve. After delivering the woe to Jerusalem, he follows it up with grace. Chapter 32 being a marvelous picture of the glorious future kingdom. And by the way, we're only going to see more and more of this. If you're thinking to yourself, Isaiah talks a lot about the kingdom. Just wait. I mean, he's he's not even started. He hasn't even scratched the surface. He will spend much of the last half of the book looking at and calling us toward looking to the kingdom of God. And it's wonderful. Well, he talks about it briefly there in chapter 32. Well, that brings us to the fourth and final woe connected to the other woes. Verse 1 of chapter 33. Woe to you, O destroyer, while you were not destroyed. And he who is treacherous, while others did not deal treacherously with him. As soon as you finish destroying, you will be destroyed. As soon as you cease to deal treacherously, others will deal treacherously with you. The fourth and final woe, woe to the destroyer and to he who is treacherous. And God does what we have seen him do before. He does it with Assyria. He will do it again with Babylon. He punishes the punisher. Okay? He spanks the paddle, if you will. He will use Assyria to to punish northern Israel... He will use Babylon to come against southern Judah, but then he turns around and says, though you were my tool, my instrument of discipline, I am now going to punish you for doing what you did. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Oh, it's absolutely fair. Because God is absolutely fair and absolutely just. And it reminds us that once again, God, though he will discipline, he will punish his people, God is absolutely protective and loving of his people. So here we are in this fourth woe, woe to the destroyer, woe to he who is treacherous. Who's this talking about? Destroyer in the Hebrew is Shaddad. Shaddad is the Hebrew word. It means one who spoils or devastates violently. And the destroyer was historically Assyria. Nothing new. Judah's immediate existential threat. Assyria, who had already destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel at this time before these woes were even finished. And Lord willing, next week when we come back, we're going to see the historical drama play out. The actual history in the book of Isaiah, chapter 36 through 39, is the history happening to King Hezekiah and Isaiah in that time when Assyria was bearing down on Judah. He gives the historical account of this, the invasion of Sennacherib in the 14th year of King Hezekiah. That, that's for next week. And by the way, once we finish that, then we hit chapter 40. And from chapter 40 all the way to the end of the book, we are now in the book of Consolation. It's awesome. I'm very excited to get there. Now, as we've seen Assyria spread out across the Middle East, just destroying everything in their wake. 
devastating nations, spoiling cities. But within 20 years of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, his siege on Jerusalem, within 20 years he would be dead. Sennacherib would be assassinated by his own two sons. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 37 tells the story. He's in the temple of Nisroch, which was the god of Assyria. Sennacherib in that temple. Sennacherib, who you could connect to or call the destroyer, is in the temple. He's destroyed so much. And here he is worshiping his god Nisroch when his sons come in and they take him out. The destroyer is destroyed. Eighty years after that, Assyria will be in decline, as nations often do before they finally fall. And then Babylon, 80 years later, will come in and wipe out Assyria completely. The mighty eagle of Assyria, you could say, Nisroch, the god of Assyria, was a god, an idol that had an eagle's head and eagle's wings on a man's body. That's Nisroch, the mighty eagle of Assyria. And then the lion comes along. The lion would be Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. The lion comes along and crushes the eagle, drops it out of the sky, defeathers it, plucks it, if you will, kills it, wipes it out. The eagle. In other words, Nisroch got rocked. Kind of one way to look at it. Now, I have no doubt that the people of Assyria, just the common citizens of Assyria, figured that their mighty country would never fall. Which should be a warning to us not to put too much faith in an eagle. My fellow Americans. And please understand, when I talk about our country, I, I'm not meaning to undermine. And I am not meaning to stand against. I believe God has done a mighty work in America. I believe he still could if, if we would turn our hearts to him. But my trust is not in America. My trust is not in our president. It is not in our Congress. It is not in our Senate. It is not in our judiciary. That's not where my trust lies. More about that later. The destroyer. Gang, the destroyer is not the only focus of this woe. The destroyer of Syria, historically, also the treacherous one. Now, if the destroyer is historically of Syria, who is the treacherous one? The word in the Hebrew is Bagad. And so a lot of times you see Isaiah, he, he, in the Hebrew, he's using words that have a rhyme scheme to them or, or some kind of a wordplay, turn of a phrase. He's marvelous with this. Shaddad and Bagad, he says. The destroyer and the treacherous one. Well, the destroyer's Assyria, the treacherous one, one who deals deceitfully. This is probably a warning to those in Judah who are heading down to Egypt treacherously, deceitfully. They're not turning to the Lord. Instead, they're turning the other direction, seeking secret alliances. And that's the history. So both the destroyer and those of you who are treacherous, who would turn the hearts of the people away from God and to some other power or authority. But prophetically, the destroyer and the treacherous one speaks differently. Historically, we understand, again, Assyria and perhaps those of Judah who would undermine the Lord. Or undermine his direction for the people. But prophetically speaking, who in scripture does the destroyer call to mind? Satan. Absolutely. Satan. He's often called the destroyer. So prophetically speaking, we could say the destroyer will go down. Just as verse 1 says, as soon as you finish destroying, you will be destroyed. The scripture is clear about that. The direction, the future of Satan is not a good one. Which is why we say from time to time, the next time Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Right? The destroyer will be destroyed. So who's the treacherous one prophetically? And I would say it pictures our sin nature. Because our sin nature is the treachery by which we fall. Our sin nature, think of it this way, gang, is the greatest weapon of Satan. It is the tool he uses more effectively and better than any other. He can bring people against you. And that may be difficult, but you can stand. But when he works from within, whether it's within a church body to destroy or within your own person to destroy, the treacherous one, the sin nature, it always comes back around, always bites us. We always reap what we sow. It's just an absolute spiritual fact that is as true as the facts of nature. As solid as gravity. You know, we trust in gravity that we're not all going to go floating off the planet. In the same way, we trust in the spiritual laws of God, one of which is you reap exactly what you sow. 
Be sure your sin will find you out. And so the sin nature is the treacherous one. Praise the Lord as soon as you cease to deal treacherously, others will deal treacherously with you. In other words, the treacherous one will be taken out just as the destroyer is taken out. And there is only one hope for any man or woman, one hope, you know it, to uh, to avoid or to escape sin's duplicity. Verse 2, Isaiah talks about it. O oh Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. It says, be their strength every morning. That I don't know why they translated that. I couldn't find an answer to this, but it should be, be our strength every morning. The Hebrew there is pretty specific. And if you're reading a King James or some other translation, perhaps it says our there. Be our strength every morning. Our salvation also in the time of distress. At the sound of the tumult, peoples flee. At the lifting up of yourself, nations disperse. Your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers, as locusts rushing about men rush about on it. The Lord is exalted, for He dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. He will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is His treasure. And Isaiah reminds us that in dark times or any time, that the Lord is, verse 2, our strength and our salvation. That's where our strength lies, with the Lord. Note the other words he uses here in this passage, verse 5. Justice and righteousness is what the Lord brings. In verse 6, stability, salvation, wisdom, knowledge. And finally he ends with the fear of the Lord, which Isaiah calls his treasure. Whose treasure? The person who's been saved. The person who finds their strength in the Lord. Your treasure is the fear of the Lord. I like the way that's written because truly the fear of the Lord unlocks all of these other blessings. The strength, the salvation, justice, righteousness, stability, salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. All of this comes about through and by the fear of the Lord. For as I fear the Lord, these things, these other treasures, if you will, are unlocked before me. Job knew this. Job 28, 28. Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. David knew it, Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Solomon, of course, talked about it a lot in the Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes. And he ends the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13, the conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God, keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is our treasure, because you know, fear God, And you'll fear nothing. Fear man, and you're going to fear everything. So the fear of the Lord, our treasure. Verse 7, he says, Behold, their brave men cry in the streets. The ambassadors of peace weep bitterly. Isaiah is pointing out something that happened historically, talking about fear in Jerusalem, fear in Judah. And he uses intricate language here. And, I, you know, there are times I, I dis, we discover these Hebrew words and say, oh, Lord, I just wish I could read the whole thing in Hebrew because it would flow. We would get the flow. But he used a very intricate, intentional language in this single verse. Listen to it again. He says, let me see if I can break this down for you. He says, behold, there brave men cry in the streets. The ambassadors of peace weep bitterly. Brave men there, the word brave is eral. Eral, which means hero or valiant one. But it's abbreviated. Eral is abbreviated word from the primary word that it comes from, which is ariel. Arel, or eral, brave one, valiant one, hero, eral, coming from ariel, which means lion-like. Or hearth, as we talked about. Now, if that sounds confusing, that a single word would mean two things, we have all kinds of words that mean two things that are completely unrelated. You know, When I say, it's cold outside, you know what I mean. If I say, she is so cold, doesn't necessarily mean she needs a jacket. Yeah. Okay? It may mean that her heart is just cut off from me. So, same word, completely different meanings. Ariel means hearth, like a furnace, or lion-like. But in this context, we are talking about lion-like, Errol, valiant one, abbreviated from Ariel. What's, what's he playing at here? What, what is Isaiah trying to, to point out here? Apparently, 
Historically, what happened is as Sennacherib came close to Jerusalem, Hezekiah sent out brave men, Errol, Ariel-like, lion-like men. He sent them out as ambassadors to negotiate peace with Sennacherib. Sennacherib and the annals of Assyria, the, the historical books of Assyria, tell this story that Sennacherib brutalizes them and then sends them back to Jerusalem weeping. Since these brave lion-like men, now these guys come back and they're in tears, crying. In other words, the heroes got burned. They are all, the heroes, the lion-like men got Ariel. They got burned as in a hearth as they come back into, into Jerusalem, weeping and crying like babies. And I just, I'm so amazed with Isaiah's use of language. He could give Shakespeare a total run for his money. And if we could see that, that's why I will, every now and then I want to stop and point out just the, the language of this, because Isaiah is absolutely brilliant. Of course, this is written by the Spirit of God, using the brilliance of man and the language to speak his word to us. So verse 8 going on, the highways are desolate. The traveler has ceased. He has broken the covenant has despised the cities. Now, we know Satan's going to break a covenant one day. Antichrist will break a covenant. And so the fact that Satan is the destroyer helps us understand who it is behind Assyria and who he's, who's driving the evil here. He's broken the covenant, despised the cities. He has no regard for man. Verse 9, the land mourns and pines away. Lebanon is shamed and withers. Sharon is like a desert plain. Bashan and Carmel lose their foliage. Isaiah mentions these four areas in the land, Lebanon, Sharon, Bashan, Carmel. These are the most fertile areas in the land of Israel. Even today, the Sharon Valley produces amazing amounts of fruit and foliage and vegetables and vegetation of all kinds. These are four very beautiful areas, and Assyria has apparently devastated them. And the roads are desolate. No one's walking. Nobody's. I mean, Assyria has just literally come right up to the very throat of Judah surrounding Jerusalem and wiping out much of what was good in the land. Verse 10. Now I will arise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will be lifted up. And he waits until the people realize their absolute need for him. Sometimes he does that in my life. And in yours, he waits. He allows it to get bad enough for us to finally turn around and go, God, I I cannot do this. I've exhausted every last possibility, every last ounce of my own human ingenuity. I have used, I can't make this happen. Please help me. And the Lord says, good. (laughs) Now we can do something together. Now you're ready to see my strength. And so I love verse 10. I will arise. I will be exalted. I will be lifted up. And of course, historically, as we'll find out next week, he is exalted and lifted up. He does arise and do a mighty thing against Assyria. Now, I want to give you a side note here, another textual thing here. For those who like the idea of Deutero-Isaiah, which we addressed when we first opened the book, Deutero-Isaiah, 2nd Isaiah, Some say uh, there's a third Isaiah, that Isaiah only wrote the prophet part of the book, and then someone came along and from chapter 40 on wrote something else, and it was written at a later date and all that, and and it's bull. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit linguistically. It's it's just a, a lame concept trying to undermine the book. And as we pointed out when we started, the Dead Sea Scrolls prove a single copy of Isaiah. In fact... If you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we don't have to look at right now, but if you did, you'd find that chapter 39 going into chapter 40 is all written on one scroll. It goes about halfway into chapter 40 before it goes on to the next scroll, and so there's no break between books as if it was two separate writings. The scribe writing in the Dead Sea Scrolls wrote just directly straight on down. In the Septuagint, 250 years before Christ, Isaiah was a single book, not broken into one or two parts. But this is another example, verse 10 here, for those who want to try and break this into two or more books, verse 10, the language is almost identical to the language that Isaiah uses in chapter 52, verse 13, which would fall into Deutero-Isaiah. Isaiah 52, verse 13 says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And the Hebrew verbs he uses there are very close, if not identical, to the verbs he uses right here. 
And it's one of dozens of examples where the first half and the latter half of the book uses the same type of terminology that Isaiah would use throughout. One book, one author, right? Spirit of Christ. One writer, Isaiah. I will arise, I will be exalted, I will be lifted up. Verse 10. You have conceived chaff. You will give birth to stubble. My breath will consume you like a fire. The peoples will be burned to lime like cut thorns which are burned in the fire. Cut thorns. I want to remind you, if you were here Sunday, what we talked about. If you weren't, listen to this. No rose in the Garden of Eden or anywhere on earth ever had a thorn until sin came into the world. Because thorns were a consequence of of sin. Genesis 3:18, 17 and 18, the Lord said to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. Which gives such amazing significance to the fact that Jesus wore a crown of thorns to the cross. Another emblem, symbol crowned with our sin, taking our sin on himself. Now I point that out because at this point in the prophecy, Isaiah begins to turn the lens to a wide angle. Okay, he begins now to truly leave the history of Assyria, this Syria as the destroyer, the treacherous ones as those of Judah who would turn from the Lord, to leave this whole historical thing and to become prophetical as he continues on from here, dealing with bigger issues. Verse 13, you who are far away, hear what I have done. That's us tonight, by the way. And you who are near, acknowledge my might. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Who among us can live with continual burning? Truly, good question. Who can? Who can stand hell? Who can face and deal with The continual burning, the terrifying thought that plagues the fears of every sinner, whether they will admit it or not, is the possibility that there truly is hell. That there really is. I mean, how how is it possible? How can there possibly be a place of continual burning? You know, we talk about this a lot. I realize that. But so does the Word of God. Hell is discussed, pointed out. Many times, and this is just one of the many in verse 14, who among us can live with continual burning, everlasting fire? Who, who, can, who can bear up? John clearly testifies of this in the Revelation. Revelation 19.20, telling us the beast, Antichrist, was seized. With him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. An allegory? A metaphor? Or the reality? Now, once Antichrist and the false prophet have done all the things that they're going to do, I doubt there would be a person on earth who wouldn't say, yeah, let them burn forever for what they've done. And this concept of eternal burning, perhaps you've heard this. People say, it's not fair. It's not fair that, that, that God would punish someone for eternity. Is it fair that you or that I should sin against an eternal God? Now see, this is something we miss. We think in temporary terms. But God is not temporary. God is eternal. And when we sin against Him, when we rebel against Him, we are rebelling against the eternal one. What is fair? I know he is. Now after the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone, you Bible students know the devil himself will be chained up for a thousand years. Revelation 20. Chained for a thousand years, then he's going to be set free for a short amount of time, and he's going to deceive the nations, and he's going to lead a massive rebellion which the Lord very quickly puts down. And finally, Revelation 20 verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Which tells us something about the devil. A, he's not in hell right now. It's not like his headquarters. (laughs) All the jokes are wrong. And B, he will be thrown into hell, but not as its king or ruler, but as a tormented one like any other being thrown into hell. 
The destroyer will be destroyed. After that, judgment day takes place. Revelation 20, verse 14. And then, death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Tells you something else, right? That death will be abolished. That Hades is not hell. That Hades is a temporary holding place that God will do away with completely. Thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The lake of fire. And among us here, there may be many of us before Christ comes. I hope not. But there may be many before God calls us home who experience the first death. That's okay. That's all right. No big deal because the first death is just a physical death. You will be resurrected. You will be with Christ forever if you die in Christ. First death. No big deal. You know, it's a door to walk through. And it's either going to be the first death or the rapture of the church. Obviously, my preference. But that's going to happen. The second death is the one you do not want to experience. It is the spiritual death. And Revelation 20.15 says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So, Rick, why go off on this just because of the phrase continual burning? (laughs) Why just take this this one verse and, and go off on hell like this? Gang, there are far too many people who want to water down hell and you can't do it. You just can't do it. It denies the truth of Scripture. It denies the word of the Lord. By its own definition, there's not enough water in the created universe to water down hell. And God talks about it and brings it to the fore. And Jesus talked about hell more often than he talked about heaven itself. I was sent this quote in an email today, and I just had to share it with you. 1827, William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army, said the following. Profound words that, if I didn't know better, I'd say he spoke a prophecy in those days about America. Listen to this. The chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Politics without God. Which, by the way, is right where we're headed. And the last thing he says, and heaven without hell. Now, that's a, that's a whole Sunday morning right there. <laughs> I can sit there and just talk about William Booth's comment there. You know, religion without the Holy Spirit. And there's all kinds of religion without the Holy Spirit in the world today. Or or Christianity without Christ. Well, what does that look like? Um, Mormonism. (laughs) Christianity, all the trappings, the look on the outside. A Mormon will tell you I'm a Christian. But the Jesus that they worship is not the Jesus of Scripture. It's a completely different Jesus. The Jesus of Mormonism is Satan's brother. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Jesus of Mormonism, just one of many gods, as you yourself can be if you are good enough and have enough good works in your life and eventually attain to godness. Completely different Jesus than the Jesus of Scripture, who is God, eternal, everlasting, in the flesh, lived among us, died, resurrected. Completely different Jesus. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Well, that's what our world calls for right now all the time. It doesn't matter if you change your behavior or change your life or change your direction at all. It doesn't matter. Just let it go, man. Just tolerate it. Tolerate everything except Christianity, right? Salvation without regeneration. I mean, salvation is regeneration. Salvation should change us. We should be in that process of change. And I I stand convicted before you because, gang, I do. I look at my own life and I say, Lord, am I different now than I was six months ago? Am I in the process of spiritual, grace-filled change? Am I more righteous as a follower of Jesus now than I was when we started the bridge? These are questions I ask myself. Politics without God, I don't even need to talk about that. And heaven without hell. Here's the bottom line. Where there are no clear choices, people won't make choices. People won't choose. They'll ride the fence. The critical question of our final destination gets completely lost in the commotion of living when it's not clear where we're possibly headed. And that's why the world doesn't want to talk about hell. Because if I don't have to talk about hell and think about hell, I don't have to make a choice. 
I'll just live my life and ignore the fact that someday I'm going to die or, you know, something's going to happen that will change the direction of things. I just will reject hell and that way I don't have to think about it. Jesus talked about hell. The Spirit, through Isaiah, right here, raises the issue of hell, the continual burning. Why? Because Jesus, the Spirit of God, the Lord, the Father, are about salvation. And part of explaining salvation is is showing there is a need to be saved. There is something to be saved from. And so hell, the continual burning, is talked about. Now Isaiah is about to answer the same questions that David asked. In Psalm 15 and Psalm 24, David said in Psalm 15, verse 1, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? And who may dwell on your holy hill? Psalm 24, verse 3, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? David asked those questions. Listen to Isaiah, verse 15. He answers, he who walks righteously. And speaks with sincerity. He who rejects unjust gain. And shakes his hands so that they hold no bribe. Who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed. And shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. He will dwell on the heights. His refuge will be the impregnable rock. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Your eyes, he says, will see the king in his beauty. They will behold a far distant land. Only this person. (laughs) What is he saying? A couple of things to jot down if you're taking notes. Number one, claim righteousness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, claim righteousness. Do not wallow in sin any longer. If you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, claim righteousness. These things, walk righteously, speak with sincerity, reject unjust gain. You stop your ears from even hearing about bloodshed or even looking upon these things. Eyes from even looking on evil. This is incredibly convicting stuff. Claim righteousness. I read this and I thought, Lord, I, I would love to claim righteousness. And on my good days, <laughs> I can even fool myself into thinking that I've done okay. The truth is, I know I don't walk righteously. I think about my life. I'm occasionally insincere. I know that's shocking to you. I've made a few unjust bucks in my day. I'm sure none of you have. But And what would my favorite TV show or movies be without bloodshed and evil? I mean, come on! You know? And Isaiah says... He who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed or shuts his eyes from looking on evil things. This is the type of person. Claim righteousness. Claim righteousness. He says in verse 17, your eyes will see the king. And that's what we want, right? I want to see Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. I want to claim my righteousness. But how do I do it? Isn't the grace of God amazing? Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Aren't you glad to know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? By grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Here's how you claim righteousness. (laughs) You praise God for His grace. You accept, you receive His grace. Aren't you thankful that Jesus makes us all clean? Just as He told Peter... John 13, verse 10, Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, the Lord said to his followers. You're clean. How are we clean, Lord? By my grace. I've made you clean. Wash your feet, because you're walking in a world of sin, and they're going to get dusty and dirty, and you're going to get sin sticking on you. Wash your feet. But grace saves us. Romans 5.21, Paul says, As sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So understand this. When Isaiah calls us to righteous living, 
When the Spirit says, live righteously, claim righteousness, understand that our claim to righteousness is not a license to trample all over grace. Say, I've received grace, so I want to now live righteously, not trample on the very grace that I've been received. But watch this. Read verse 18. Still talking about those who would who would be able to avoid this continual burning, those who would rise to the heights to see the king, to behold the far distant land. He says, your heart will meditate on terror. What? Where is he who counts? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? Meditate, what? Meditate on terror. What's he talking about here? Gang, claim righteousness. Secondly, consider grace. Consider grace. Isaiah is saying to the people, think about how different life would be or was, in many of our cases, under the terror of the destroyer as compared to the grace of the king. He literally says, your heart will meditate on terror. Now this is, this is interesting because he's talking about after the fact, after their salvation. In the historical context, Jerusalem, when Assyria is wiped out, your heart will meditate on terror. You're going to think about how close you came to dying. You're going to think about how bad it got. You're going to think about how awful it would have been had Assyria, the destroyer, taken you out. You're going to meditate on terror. Now, this doesn't mean we sit around and we think about bad things, but... Isaiah is saying a day is going to come for Israel when they will see their king. And by the way, the king here in verse 17, verse, yeah, verse 17, your eyes will see the king. It is Messiah he's talking about. He's not just talking about Hezekiah or Hezekiah's son Manasseh, who is not a good king. He's not talking about king's following. He's talking about Messiah. Your eyes are going to see the king. And in that day, Israel is going to wonder. Whatever happened to those foreign nations who counted out taxes against our land? Where is he who counts? Where is he who weighs? Those who weighed out heavy burdens for the Jewish people. Where is he who counts the towers? That is to knock them down. Where are those who made battle plans again? Where are they? Meditate on terror just for a moment longer, the Lord would say. Where are those who terrorized you, Israel? Where's Hezbollah? Where's Hamas? Where are they? The destroyer has been destroyed. And so another way, literally, of saying meditate on terror is consider grace. Look at how far the Lord has saved you. How much He has done. David said in Psalm 31, 7, I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul. You have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. David considered the enemy all the time in comparison to the glorious grace and salvation of his loving God. And so to meditate on terror is simply to do that, to look back. Again, because the more we understand his grace, the more we will consider the amazing contrast of his grace to those days of terror now long behind us. Verse 19. Verse 19 reads, You will no longer see a fierce people, the people of unintelligible speech, which no one comprehends, of a stammering tongue, which no one understands. Again, speaking of Assyria. All these things, Israel, passed. All these things, Judah, passed. All these things, brothers and sisters, passed. Behind us, Meditate on that. The marvelous grace of God. So claim righteousness. Consider grace. And thirdly, center in on Zion. Verse 20. Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed peace. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an undisturbed habitation. A tent which will not be folded. Its stakes will never be pulled up. Nor any of its cords be torn apart. Has the tent of Jerusalem been folded over the years? Have the stakes been pulled up? Have the, have the cords been torn apart? Absolutely. Oh, so God's not capable of bringing this about? He just hasn't yet. He's going to. 
There the majestic one, the Lord, will be for us. A place of rivers and wide canals on which no boat with oars will go and on which no mighty ship will pass. This speaks of the permanence of Jerusalem as God's capital city. And a day is coming, gang, when Jerusalem will permanently remain. It will permanently stand. There were cities in ancient days, Nineveh was one of them, Babylon was another, that were encompassed by rivers and canals. And so great and mighty were those cities that ships could not sail those canals, at least unharassed. You couldn't sail into Babylon. You know, when Cyrus would, would take Babylon, he did it by draining out the water and walking underneath the city's channels. But you couldn't sail a ship in there. And that's the description he's giving. He's comparing it to these other great cities and saying, Jerusalem's going to be like that. Better. It will be impregnable, encompassed by rivers and canals for water, as well as for protection. But what's different about the coming Jerusalem as opposed to those cities is the Lord himself will be the protection. Keep your finger here and just go over to Revelation 21 for a minute. Revelation 21, verse 10. Because Jerusalem as it is right now, you know, one of the big questions politically is, will Jerusalem ever be divided? Netanyahu says, no, we will not divide Jerusalem. East Jerusalem, which contains the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, many of the old sites, the old city of Jerusalem, that's, that's the area that Palestinians claim is the West Bank and they want it for their own. And Netanyahu is saying, no way. We will not divide the city of Jerusalem. And I've had a lot of people ask me, biblically, Rick, will Jerusalem be divided? Could still be. It may be yet. But ultimately, Jerusalem will stand. Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom will be home. It'll be home to us. Home to the Jewish people. The capital of the entire millennium, capital of the world, will be Jerusalem. But even after that, when God creates a new heaven, a new earth, he will create, you know, a new Jerusalem. Verse tw- uh, 10 of chapter 21, he carried me away in the spirit, in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. God is the protector. God is the point of new Jerusalem. It is all focused on and about him. And if you skip on down to verse 21, watch this. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it. Why not? For the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. He is the protection. He is the temple. He is the point. Verse 23. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of the Lord has illumined it. And its lamp is the lamb. You guys know I I bought that little sunlight lamp for my desk. Some of you have asked, how's that working out for you, Rick? Not too well, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't think it was worth it, but whatever. God will illumine New Jerusalem in such a way you will never miss the sun. You will get plenty of vitamin D simply from the Lord, from His glory illuminating New Jerusalem. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Center in on Zion, gang. The reason we go to Revelation so often is the same reason I believe Isaiah talks about the kingdom so often. Center in on Zion. For as much as we know, yes, there is hell. There's also a glorious kingdom. And God wants us to see that and to focus on it. That is our vision. That is where we're heading. To be with Jesus in that marvelous, wonderful place. We're going to be there. Did you know, by the way, verse 21, notice this, the 12 gates of the city are made out of pearl. Isn't that beautiful? It's also unclean if you're Jewish. Pearls come from oysters, and oysters are unclean animals. You're not supposed to eat an oyster. You shouldn't have really anything to do with pearls if you're a kosher Jew. Well, so why in the world would God make the gates of New Jerusalem out of pearls? Pearls are a picture gang of Gentiles. The beauty of the Gentiles. And I believe the Lord is portraying for us entrance into New Jerusalem. Where the church, where the Gentile, as well as the Jew, will make an entrance into that beautiful city. Center in on Zion. The Hebrew writer does it. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. I really like that line. See, we're the righteous right now, but we are going to be the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus who, and I'm just going to jump the gun on you here, Spencer, and say Jesus is the point of the marvelous kingdom. He is the reason why it's so wonderful. The mediator of a new covenant to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel, because, of course, the blood of Abel speaks of judgment and crying for justice, whereas the blood of Jesus speaks of forgiveness and salvation in the coming city of Jerusalem, in the coming kingdom. So center in on Zion. Verse 22 Look at this. Point something out interesting for you. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save this. Isaiah 33 verse 22 is where the founders of America got the plan. This is it. I don't know if you knew this. This is where the idea came for our form of government. Judge, lawgiver, king. Three branches of government, judicial, legislative, executive. And it comes from Isaiah 33, 22. And I'm not sure which of the guys was reading this who picked up on this, thinking here's the perfect form of government, a perfect balance of power, a judicial branch, right? Supreme Court. And then you've got the legislative branch, right? The Congress, the Senate. Some of you are going, I didn't know we were doing civics tonight. We are. And then there's the executive branch, of course, the White House, the president. And, and of course, in our country, all three branches function marvelously together. <laughs> we're, we're watching right now. Everybody's watching a national tug of war going on. Between, typically, it's between the executive branch and the legislative branch go back and forth. You know, if you have, uh, say, a Republican president and a Democratic Congress or vice versa, and they fight it out and try and get the laws written, and, you know, you hear the word gridlock all the time. It's rare, but right now it's happening that the battle is between the executive branch and the judicial branch. As the judges take up the cause of health care, Obama health care, his signature plan. So they're taking up that and they're considering it and Obama's throwing out threats that you can't change, that you don't have a right, you're not elected. I mean, all this stuff going on. Why doesn't it work? Our founding fathers, they read this. Look at this. Judge, lawgiver, king. It should work. Well, they forgot. The Lord is the judge. And the Lord is the lawgiver. And the Lord is the king. Underline this. He will save us. And so long as... America, so long as you, so long as I keep our focus on the Lord, He becomes all three for us, and He functions perfectly together. The Lord is judge, never debates with the Lord as lawgiver. And the Lord is lawgiver, never debates with the executive branch. The Lord is king, it's all the Lord. Right? And He will save us. Perhaps that's another reason the cherubim. Day and night around the throne of God never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Holy, holy, holy. Three holies. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. Holy Judge, Holy Lawgiver, Holy King. God is holy on all accounts. Verse 23. Verse 23, he gives us just in the first half of the verse a little metaphor, a little word picture for you. Your tackle hangs slack. It cannot hold the base of its mast firmly, nor spread out the sail. Tackle, mast, sail. What's he talking about? A ship, right? He gives a picture of a ship. A ship that is not in good shape. Now, I need you to understand that a lot of commentators, they look at this verse and they feel like it kind of comes out of nowhere. We're talking about the judge, the lawgiver, the king. We're talking about God's salvation. It's wonderful. And all of a sudden, he's talking about a ship. And it's not a pretty picture of a ship either. This is a tattered ship. This is a ship whose, whose tackle is hanging there. You, you picture a ship coming in out of a storm, perhaps an old a cutter ship coming in out of a storm. And the mast is broken on its side and the sails hang loose and the, and the tackle is hanging off of the sides and it's been ravaged and it's torn apart. You can't even put a sail up. It's in really bad shape. But, but listen, 
it is in the harbor. It's reached the harbor. And the picture Isaiah is giving here, he says, here's, here's you, Israel. You're this ship. You're thrashed. You're trashed. You're in disarray. You're sitting dockside after a fierce storm. And it's the perfect characterization, characterization of Jerusalem, of Israel. When Jesus comes, the city will be trashed. The Bible tells us a tenth of the city is going to literally fall by earthquake. The rest of the city smoldering from the trashing of the tribulation. And what's interesting is here, speaking of this time when Jesus returns and all this horror has taken place on planet Earth and, and he steps in. Our judge, our lawgiver, our king comes back to planet Earth. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, notice this, says, From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, that is, at the midpoint of the tribulation, from that time forward, there will be 1,290 days. Okay, so from the midpoint of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation on into the millennial kingdom will be 1,290 days. Now, there's a little problem here. Because if you read Revelation, it it tells us 1,260 days, which is three and a half years. Daniel says 1,290 days. He adds an additional 30 days here. Okay, but it doesn't stop there. Verse 12 of Daniel chapter 12 He says, how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. What? He has another 45 days. So put it all together, 75 days after the end, after the coming of Christ. Daniel says, and he's clear about this. From the midpoint of the tribulation, he says, blessed, blessed is the person who makes it 75 days into the kingdom. 75 days beyond the coming of Jesus. That person, that's the person who is blessed. Why do we need 75 days at the outset of the kingdom? And I would say, gang, to repair the ship. To restore the crew. Jesus comes back. Where's Israel? Where's the remnant of believing Israel at that time? They're still hiding out in a place prepared in the wilderness. Got to get the the people home. What's happened to the temple? The temple is a a disaster. It's got to be built. The new temple, the real temple. What about Jerusalem? It's in terrible shape. How about the world? Needs some restoration, gang. I mean, read through the plagues throughout the book of Revelation. This planet will be trashed. 75 days to repair the ship. To restore the crew. To renew the the seas, to rebuild Jerusalem, recall the remnant of Israel. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 12 says, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is. He will build the temple of the Lord. And all the Jewish rabbis recognize that is messianic. Messiah, when he comes, is going to rebuild the temple. Yes, verse 13, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. He will be a priest on his throne and the council of peace will be between the two offices of priest and the office of king. Only Messiah can be a priest and a king. Only Messiah can be a pastor and a politician. (laughs) Only Messiah can handle it. And Jesus will. So 75 days, this tattered Tackle hanging slack. This ship comes into harbor, but it's it's battered, it's bruised, it's in bad, bad shape. But it's there, and it's time to rebuild. Watch this. Verse 23, the latter half of the verse. Then, then the prey of an abundant spoil will be divided, and the lame will take the plunder. What's that mean? It means the lame... We're going to get some treasure here. Great news. I really like that. The lame will take the plunder. Hey, I'm lame. Some of you are going, I know. I know you are, right? (laughs) No, we are. The lame who are made to walk again. The blind who are given sight. The deaf who now can hear. The heart broken people whose hearts have been restored. The people of Israel made lame, but now receiving the plunder. See, the ship is in bad shape, but the ship is going to be restored. 
The crew will return. And now though the crew was lame, they will receive plunder. This is, this is the picture that Isaiah is drawing for us. It's a beautiful picture. Verse 24. And no resident, no resident, and we're talking about of Jerusalem, will say, I'm sick. The people who dwell there, note this, will be forgiven their iniquity. And Isaiah does something here that's great. He directly connects sickness and sin. No one will say I'm sick. Why not? Because you will have been forgiven. He doesn't say healed. He says forgiven. Because to be forgiven of sin is to be healed. And we can take this a step further. Gang, no amount of medical advances in our world can cure sin. That's something the medical establishment will never accomplish. They will never find a cure for sin. As it is, there are all kinds of incurable diseases in the world. Here are the top ten. Top ten incurable diseases, these diseases that ultimately result in death. Number ten, Ebola. You want to avoid that one. Number nine, polio. Number eight, lupus. Number seven, influenza. Number six, Kreutzfeldt Jacob or Jacob, and it's it's a debilitating disease that causes dementia. That's number six on the line. I never heard it before. Number five, diabetes. Number four, HIV and AIDS. Number three, asthma. By the way, let me. I got to give God a praise for this. My son Hayden was born with asthma. Bad, bad asthma. We spent many, many nights in the hospital emergency room with him not able to breathe at all. We spent many other nights with him sitting there at the breathing machine, sitting on our couch in our living room late at night with a little breather just so that he could get breath back into his lungs again. He was about four, four or five years old, and I just started praying, Lord, would you take the asthma? Would just take it away. Just heal him completely. Hayden doesn't have any asthma. God healed my son of asthma completely. And I praise him for that. Number three on the list is asthma. Number two on the list is cancer. And of course, the real killer. Number one on the list. Are you ready for this? The common cold. Number one. Can't cure it. You just got to live through it. Well, in America, we just, you know, we pop a couple of pills. We take an aspirin. We go to bed for a little while. We're fine. But in the world wide, when the common cold hits, you would be shocked at how many people are killed by it. Top ten things. Something wonderful, an old promise God gave back at the time of the Exodus that will find absolute, complete fulfillment in the coming age, the kingdom age. Exodus 23, 25, he says, You shall serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. Well, how does that work, gang? It works because forgiveness equals healing. Sin equals sickness. Forgiveness equals healing. More than any other remedy, what we desperately need, all of us, is eternal forgiveness. Because forgiveness brings healing. Isaiah 53, 5, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. And that prophecy, you know, played out on the cross as the blood was streaming from Jesus' broken body. And He cried, Father, heal them! Oh, no, he didn't, did he? He said, Father, forgive them. Luke 23, 24, forgiveness is healing. And so Isaiah says, the people who dwell there will be forgiven their iniquity. That's why no resident will say, I am sick. Chapters 34 and 35 are an epilogue now to the book of woes. The book of woes itself is finished. We're going to look at chapter 35 on Sunday. So we'll just finish out here with chapter 34. But we're in the epilogue now. And in them, Isaiah even pulls back further. The the lens gets widened to where we see the the run-up all the way to the beginning of the kingdom. Chapter 34 is the run-up to the kingdom. Chapter 35 is a sweeping description of the kingdom. So we're just going to look at chapter 34, preparing then for Sunday, chapter 35, unless Jesus comes, in which case we'll just experience chapter 35, okay? But before we do chapter 34, let me draw back just for a second here. We, uh, we had an epilogue to the Israel tour, and I've mentioned this, and some of you were on that epilogue. There was a group of, about half of the group who stayed, half went to Tel Aviv and then flew on home. 
And half of us got on a bus the next morning and we headed south. And we drove down through the Negev of Israel, down to Timna. We saw some cool things there, down all the way south until we came to the border there with Jordan. And we crossed over into Jordan. And I can't even describe for you, and ask some of the people who experienced this, I cannot describe for you the difference in just crossing a border. I mean, it's stunning. The difference in the landscape. The difference in the architecture. The difference in the people. The difference of a land that God has called His own, and a land, note this, a land that God has cursed. Jordan is made up of three ancient countries. In the south, Edom. In the middle, Moab. And in the north, Ammon. The Ammonites. Ammon, Jordan. That's why the capital city of Ammon in the north is called Ammon, because it's from the Ammonite people. The nation of Ammon. Ammon, Moab, Edom. So we crossed over and we came literally into Edom. And everybody on the bus, as our Jordanian tour guide was going off on stuff, we're looking out the windows just, well, I don't know what everybody else was feeling, but I know what I was feeling. There's one word that I have to describe it. It was a dry, volcanic, bare, absolutely barren land. There were high mountains, but they were completely brown and dusty and bare. I, I didn't see any living thing. And as we're driving through this, the single word that just kept coming to mind as I looked out the window was desolate. This is just desolate. And I'm thinking not not a half an hour ago. When we were in Israel, it was it was desert, but it was beautiful, right? The Negev is desert, the final frontier, if you will, of Israel, but they're using it, they're working the ground, and they're doing things there, and it's, things are happening even in the desert, and it's a beautiful desert. You cross that border, and it's like desolation. What Isaiah describes in chapter 34, two things to note. Number one is the desolation of Edom. The desolation of Edom. I want you to skip down and look at verse 5 to start. My sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. Skip down to verse 9. Talking again about this specific land, its streams will be turned into pitch. Its loose, loose earth into brimstone and its land will become burning pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever. From generation to generation, it will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. But pelican and hedgehog will possess it. An owl and raven will dwell in it, and he will stretch over the line over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of emptiness. It was an empty land. Can't get it. I read this and I'm thinking, yeah, that's exactly what we saw. Completely empty. It's nobles, verse twelve. There is no one there whom they may proclaim king. <laughs> they try to. And all its princes will be nothing. Thorns will come up in its fortified towers, nettles and thistles in its fortified cities. It will be a haunt of jackals, an abode of ostriches. The desert creatures will meet with the wolves. The hairy goat will also cry to its kind. Yes, the night monster will settle there. It's interesting. And will find, no, this not himself, but herself, a resting place. The tree snake will make its nest and lay eggs there. It will hatch and gather them under its protection. Yes, the hawks will be gathered there, everyone with its kind. See, seek from the book of the Lord and read. Not one of these will be missing. None will lack its mate. For his mouth has commanded, his spirit has gathered them. He has cast the lot for them, and his hand has divided it Divided it to them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation, they will dwell in it. Talking about these desert creatures. Talking about the night monster. Talking about the desolation of Edom. And if you go to southern Jordan today, this is what you see. A desolate, volcanic land with no life. Just as Isaiah said. Other prophets will follow suit. I had a whole list of them. I'm not going to read them tonight, but they will suit. They, they will sit in judgment on Edom. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Obadiah. The entire book of Obadiah is a one-chapter judgment of Edom. 
Malachi, Zephaniah, all of these prophets talk about Edom as being a cursed desolation. Why? Well, you'll have to wait till we get to Obadiah. We'll talk about that. Southern Jordan is depressed. It's desolate. And no wonder, verse 14 tells us, the night monster has settled there. Now, <laughs> what's that all about? Let me just point out something I think is interesting. Verse 14, the night monster, she has a name. She has a Hebrew name here. It's just translated night monster or night demon in some translations. The old rabbis taught that she, yes, she was a female demon who sought to harm children and especially newborn babies. This night demon, this night monster. What is her name? Her name is Lilith. Lilith. That's the Hebrew name for the night demon. So if, if any of you ladies are planning on having children anytime soon and Lilith was on the list, you want to remove it. <laughs> I, I thought about that. And what was interesting to me, anybody recall there was a musical festival that featured all female artists that ran 1997, 98, 99, and they tried to rejuvenate it in 2010 and it completely flopped. It was founded by Sarah McLaughlin, Canadian-born singer. Remember what it was called? Lilith Fair. Lilith Fair. Now, those who buy who bought tickets just to go see female artists probably didn't think much about it, but Sarah McLaughlin did, because Lilith, according to her pagan mythology, and I'm being nice in saying it this way, Lilith, she claimed, was Adam's first wife. Before Eve. What do we discover Lilith truly is? The night demon. I saw that and I thought, you know, somebody needs to think through these names a little more before they use them for pop festivals. You know? Unless indeed the name has some meaning there, Lilith Fair. In 2010, the tour flopped because nobody wanted to go anymore, so maybe that's a good thing. Back to the prophecy. Lilith is the night demon. Edom, gang Edom, would be desolate, the desolation of Edom. But Edom's only part of the picture. In fact, in chapter 34, Edom is simply a placeholder, if you will, for the entire Christ-rejecting world. Go back to verse 1. Draw near, O nations, to hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all it contains hear, and the world and all that springs from it. So you know we're talking about more than Jerusalem now, more than Judah, more than Edom. We're talking about the entire earth. For the Lord's indignation is against all the nations, and His wrath against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. We have just launched forward, gang, to the end of the last battle. So their slain will be thrown out. Their corpses will give off their stench. The mountains will be drenched with their blood. All the hosts of heaven will wear away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. And all their hosts will also wither away as the leaf withers from the vine or as one withers from the fig tree. Down in verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is sated with fat, with the blood of lambs. And goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. And a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen will also fall with them. And young bulls with strong ones. Thus their land will be soaked with blood. And their dust become greasy with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance. A year of recompense for the cause of Zion. I want you to understand here, this is not just talking about the desolation of Edom, but now it is the devastation. The devastation at Basra. The devastation at Basra. What does that mean? Keep your finger there. Skip quickly ahead to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63. Talking about the same thing in verse 1 of Isaiah 63, the prophet says, Who is this who comes from Edom? With garments of glowing colors from Basra. This one who is majestic in his apparel. Marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness mighty to save. Who is he talking about here, do you think? Who is this majestic one who claims to be mighty, to to speak in righteousness and be mighty to save? It's Jesus. Yeah, Messiah. Verse 2. 
question is now asked of this mighty one. Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the wine press? He answers, I have trodden the wine trough alone. And from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. And their life blood is sprinkled on my garments and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. My year of redemption has come. I looked and there was no one to help. And I was astonished and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me and my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath. And I poured out their life blood on the earth. Whose garments are stained red? It is Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 Verse 13 says, He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. And you think about for a moment what happens when someone stomps on grapes. Of course, the juice spatters and splatters all over their clothing. And I want you to understand that the prophecy of Isaiah 34 and Isaiah 63 and Revelation 14 and 19, all four are parallel prophecies of the same exact event. They all speak of Jesus' return. They speak of the return, not of, not of the servant who would suffer and die and pour out his own blood, but of the warrior king who will pour out the lifeblood of rejecting mankind. And that's what's being talked about back in Isaiah 34. And Jesus apparently, apparently is going to do this in three steps. Step one is Basra. Basra. Basra is in Edom. Basra is approximately 200 miles from the valley of Megiddo. If you were to stand in Megiddo and just start traveling south, 200 miles from Megiddo down to Basra. Revelation 14.20 tells us, The winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Megiddo to Basra. Step one is Basra. Step two is Megiddo. Megiddo, the valley of Megiddo, the circuit of that valley. Some of you prophecy students, you know this. This is also called the Jezreel Valley. It's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Valley of Judgment. And it runs all the way from Megiddo down through Jerusalem, becoming in Jerusalem the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley then continues on out of Jerusalem, heading on south, all the way down to the land of Edom, to Basra, the same valley, the same crevice or fault that goes goes through that runs all the way down the point is this beginning at Basra all the way up to Megiddo all of Israel is going to be soaked in blood at the convergence of that last and great war it's a very very bloody scene step three the Mount of Olives from Basra to Megiddo to finally the Mount of Olives where Jesus actually sets foot on the mount there in Jerusalem. Zechariah 14 verse 4 is absolutely clear that he sets foot on the Mount of Olives. Just as the angel said in Acts chapter 1, why are you looking up in the sky? This Jesus who, you, who you've seen us in is going to come back exactly the same way as you've just seen him go. Well, where did he go from? The Mount of Olives. He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. And when he does, and when he steps on the mount, <laughs> Zechariah tells us it's going to split right up the middle. Now, all of this, gang, is a very bloody picture. And we contrast that with the first coming of Jesus as the suffering servant. Again, he pour out his blood, all of his blood, to save us, to give all of humanity an opportunity to be saved through his blood. But the second time he comes is also bloody in its conclusion as he comes as the warrior king. Why so much blood? Two reasons. And we'll finish tonight. Reason number one is the cost of sin. The cost of sin. What mankind has fail to completely understand, what even is difficult for you and I to understand, but we begin to grasp it here, is sin is so costly that even all the blood poured out in the valley of Megiddo for 200 miles, you know what? It, it, it still can't cover it. Sin is a costly thing. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. 
Gabriel comes to Daniel and he says, 77s have been decreed for your people. And I won't talk about that, but he's talking about 70 units of seven, 70 Shavuah. But they've been decreed for your people in your holy city. Why? What, what for? Listen, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. This is the end of the 77s. Okay, Isaiah 34, what we just read, and what's happening beginning in Basra all the way up through Megiddo, and this, this slaughter that takes place is the end. What's the purpose? To make an end of sin. This is it. To make an end of sin. To make atonement for iniquity. Why? Because if you don't accept the blood of Christ, blood is still required. Hebrews 9.22 tells us almost all things are by law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That is how serious sin truly is. That's why Jesus, on the Last Supper, Matthew 26, when He had taken a cup and given thanks, He gave it to them and He said, Drink from it, all of you. This is My blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's either His blood or yours. And once again, we're right back to this heaven versus hell contrast. The choice. His blood poured out for you or your blood poured out for your own sin. Leviticus 17.11, God says, The life is in the blood. And I have given it to you for atonement. So you would understand how serious that every time an animal is sacrificed and all that blood would drain out for the people to look at that and say... That would be me if I didn't have a sacrifice. That would be me. And so Jesus says, I have become your sacrifice. I have poured out my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this. And when we take communion, every time we take communion, that's what we're doing is we're remembering the seriousness of our sin and the lifeblood of Jesus poured out that we would be forgiven. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But if mankind does not accept his blood, blood is still required. Zephaniah 1.17 tells us, Zephaniah 1.17, I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. The cost of sin. That's why this is so bloody. The cost of sin. But there's one more reason for all the blood. There's one more reason why the land of Israel itself has to be purged, as it were, with blood. And it is, number two, the cause of Zion. Verse 8. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. How much blood has been spilled among the Jewish people over the years of history? How many Jewish people have lost their lives simply because they were called people of God? Simply not because of anything they did or said or or any way they behaved, but simply because they were called God's chosen people. How many Jewish people have had their blood poured out across history? Well, that's one reason for the blood, the cause of Zion. But also, gang, the Lord says the land is going to be purged. It will be purged in blood. It's a bloody scene, but God, who is our judge, who is our lawgiver, who is our president, our king, God is going to make everything absolutely right. And we won't do it tonight, but I'll give you this much. Isaiah 35, 1, the wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom. And we're going to talk about that on Sunday. Let's pray. Father, for all the study that we have done on this, I am still amazed at the seriousness of sin. I am still overwhelmed at the consequence. And Lord, I I recognize and I believe that you are trying to help us understand from a more eternal perspective how horrific sin truly is and how amazing your grace is by comparison. How the blood of one man, Jesus Christ, truly does cleanse every single person who would believe in Him. We declare again tonight, Lord, our belief in Jesus. 
and our thanksgiving for Your blood. And I pray, Father, we would walk with the joy of our salvation, recognizing the seriousness of our lostness outside of Christ. And, Father, may we do something about it. May we proclaim proclaim Christ to the nations. As in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Sunday, good news. Isaiah 35. You might want to read it over and think it through. It's amazing. It's beautiful. After that, we get a little history lesson. And then we are on into Isaiah 40 and on from there. Good stuff. Have a great week.